And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations. The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our program today, The World Will Know, was written by Joseph Mendel and based on material in the book Notes from the Warsaw Ghetto by Emanuel Ringelblum, edited and translated by Jacob Sloan. In the services of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the congregation pauses to remember the martyrs of generations past. Today's story is a remembrance of martyrs of more recent times. This is a story bounded by a hundred square city blocks and the days that crowded in upon them, the numbered days. September 1st, 1939. German tanks today cross the Polish border. This is the beginning. September 6, 1939. Warsaw is surrounded in three dimensions. Mass evacuation of the city. We will remain. October 2nd, 1939. The fighting is over. Warsaw is quiet. Very quiet. That which is about to happen will be new in the history of mankind. But how will the world know? His name was Emanuel Ringelblum, historian and teacher of history. If the story is bounded in time and space, you must know nevertheless it extends to the limits of heaven and earth. But the story is his and the telling should be as he would want it. In October of 1939, no longer a teacher, he worked long hours at the Jewish Central Relief Committee of Warsaw, coming home to his apartment after dark. Hey. Emmanuel, the blood on your face. No. Oh. oh, it's all right now. I, I thought I'd washed it all off. I'll get some water. What a model wife you are. No questions at all. I ask the questions every morning when you leave. Listening all day, I ask, will I hear your footsteps in the evening and the door opening? When will the door remain closed? Every morning, I ask, will it be today? Here, put the towel around you. Huh? I'll wash the blood away. <coughs> oh, the monsters to beat you so. When did it happen? Today at the office of the German occupation forces. They sent for you? No, I went to them for permission to continue the work of the Central Relief Committee. Why? You know how many thousands of refugees have poured into Warsaw? They're hungry. They have no place to live. I know that. I mean, why you? Why did you have to go? Why someone else? Yes, of course, Emmanuel. You know what he said, the... Uh... The German officer? I've seen his answer to your question. He said, don't be impatient. We have our own plans for the Jews. Oh. Well, I, I can't get up by myself. Here, take my arm. Uh, what a contradictory mechanism the human body is. I'm beaten in the head and my knees are weak. Oh, don't joke about it. Where are you going? To the table. I have some entries to make in my notebook. 
Emmanuel, you work 16, 18 hours a day, and then you sit up half the night with those slips of paper you always have in your pockets. I hear so many things from different people. If I didn't write them down, I would forget them. And if you did forget, does it matter? Someone must remember. Listen to this. A doctor told me he used to earn a thousand zwotis a day. Not anymore. Not he or any doctor. People simply haven't the money to be cured. And here's another. I don't want to hear any more. I don't want to see you write down, today I was beaten by a German officer. The point is not that I was beaten, but what the German policy is. That's what I will write down. Will you forget the pain and blood if it's not in your diary? You don't understand, my dear. It's not a diary. What happens to me, to us, the private pain is for private grief. It's my pain and my grief, and they're important to me. Of course. But the world's sorrow is also important. January 1940. Heard that the mortality among the Jews of Warsaw is 50 to 70 deaths daily. Before the war, it used to be 10. Jews fined for wearing soiled or wrinkled armbands. People taken off the street for forced labor. Look, Emmanuel. They're taking boys and old men. Come away from the window, Simon. Oh, if there were tears enough, Emmanuel. Not for me, for Rabbi Simon Uberband, but for the synagogue they burned, for the congregation broken and scattered. Tears for God's world and the children of God who have learned to suffer and inflict suffering. Don't stand at the window, Simon. It's not safe. No, they're not coming into this building. They have their quota, and they're going. Oh. Well, then, put on your coat, and we will also go. Oh, your book fell out of your coat pocket. A commentary on the Zohar. Give it to me, Emmanuel. I remember this from the Zohar. If ever a time should come when the Torah is no longer studied, the tree of life will depart and leave behind it a world that is dead. Are we seeing a prophecy fulfilled, Simon? Give me the book. Of course. I was only turning the pages. I see you've written your commentary on the commentary. My notes are private. No. No, I, I didn't mean that. They do this to us. They make us afraid to trust each other. Read what I've written, Emmanuel. The subtleties of the Zohar are not for me. Oh, please, read my notes. If you want me to. Life has become a series of insoluble dilemmas. Jewish prisoners of war returning to Warsaw are forbidden to wear military uniforms, but have no civilian clothes. The price of bread is now 23 zlotys. The courage of elderly Jews who refuse to cut off their beards... At... Simon. Maybe it's a foolish thing to do, and dangerous. No. What's happening here will not be in the history the Nazis were right, but it should be told. The telling is too much for you and me alone. Come, Simon. We have a lot to talk about and many plans to make. Well, and that's the outline of the plan. What do you think? Very good. Leave it to Ringelblum. Give him an olive and he'll organize your whole alphabet. <laughs> it's true that I sometimes get carried away, Velvo. We're not complaining, Emmanuel. To deal not with dusty manuscripts and faded inscriptions, but with the living raw material of history. We're ready, Professor. Let's begin. Velvo, I'm not always sure whether you're serious or making fun of me. In this world, Emmanuel, if you don't make fun of yourself, occasionally you could die of seriousness. Well, all right. First, the facts. They must be checked for reliability, then sorted and analyzed and summarized. And lastly, as the data accumulates, monographs must be written. Detailed accounts of particular communities, the economic life of restricted groups, social behavior and morale, and so on. Fine. We'll get you the facts. We'll be all eyes and ears. That's not enough. We'll need many more people. Emmanuel, the bigger the group, the greater the danger. It can't be helped. 
we can only exercise the greatest care in finding you people. Uh, one more thing. When the idea of such a, a brotherhood was only in my mind, I had a name for it. Oneg Shabbat. Delight of the Sabbath. A Hebrew name to fool them, huh? You have more in mind than that, haven't you, Emmanuel? Yes, I have more in mind, Simon. Oneg Shabbat. The Sabbath comes into the dreary world with beauty, an island of song among the turbulent days. Let this be our song. November 15th, 1940. The wall is complete around 100 square city blocks. The guards are posted. Today, the Warsaw Ghetto was sealed off. March 12, 1941. Paradoxically, the establishment of the ghetto has furnished greater opportunity for the archives of Oneg Shabbat to function. There, there are a great many individual notes to be sorted and distributed. Let's begin, my friends. The first, an account of the Conference on Jewish Literature. Listen to this. More than 90 celebrations of Mendela Mochus Forum's anniversary in the courtyards of apartment buildings. I'll take it, Emmanuel. That's for my group, cultural activities. Here you are, Simon. Next one, smuggling of food and goods through the wall. Economic activities, that's mine. And this one from an eyewitness. Senseless shooting on Zamenhofer Street, yesterday, shortly after curfew. Before he could show his pass, Dr. Cooperman was shot and killed. No. Belville? I say no. You must listen. He was my teacher, my friend. We all knew him. And yet you sit here sorting and classifying. Will you file the incident under atrocities or under irrational behavior of the conquerors? Don't, Belville. What good is anger? No fighting back. No anger. What do you leave us? Fear and weeping? Not those either. Emmanuel, enough for now. Leave him to his grief. No, Simon. No tears. You're hard, Emmanuel. I did not know how hard you are. You're wrong. He's not hard. He's an organizer, and he's concerned about his organization. I will make you understand me, Belville. Cooperman was also my friend. Your eyes are dry, and the notes are steady in your hand. You don't see people, only facts, data. My eyes are no different from yours. I see my friends beaten and shot. I see the fear in my wife's face when I leave here and when I return. This morning, I looked from the window and saw my son, Uri, nine years old, playing with the children in the courtyard, stepping over a corpse as they played. Oh, no, Emmanuel. Yes, Simon. But look, and you too, Velvo. My hand is steady. I will make a note for the archives. Even the children are familiars of death. I'm sorry, Emmanuel. Let's go on with the notes. No apologies, Velvo. And no tears. What your eyes see and your heart feels are for other places and other times than this. We have to tell what is happening now in this place. And the telling is the better for clear eyes. Do you hear, my brothers? No tears. September 18th, 1941. The Germans announced a reduction in food rations for the ghetto. Hunger. Almost every day I see two or three people fall dead in the street. July 22nd, 1942. Official notice of deportation to the east of the whole population of the ghetto. Men, women, and children. Emmanuel, your notes on the table. Don't open the door. Oh, it's all right. They never knock twice. Devil. Come in, Simon. Uh, I found him down in the uh, street. Oh, but what's wrong with him? 
What is it, Simon? I was in the Umschlagplatz. They, they took you for deportation? No. No, I hid in a building that overlooked the Umschlagplatz, where they load the deportation train. Oh, sit down, Simon. You're trembling. No. The screaming and the wailing. They forced them into the cars with clubs and guns, packed like cattle, struggling all the while, crying. Whole families together. Or a mother is taken, a child remains. And the cries. Oh, the cries. There was an officer. No more. Simon, it's natural to be frightened. Frightened? Emmanuel, with these same hands that once held the Torah, I wanted to tear open his throat, choke the last breath out of his body. Yes. I'm frightened. I'm so filled with hate that I'm afraid of what I can do, what I can be. You, Simon. And God help the rest of us. People talk of vengeance after the war. I know what they mean now, I know. But it's wrong. The vanquished would plan their own vengeance and it would go on forever. No, not revenge, but morality. I heard someone say... The Jewish revenge is to forgive. <laughs> Stop it, Lord. Stop it, I say. When you've decided, you and Simon, what then? What are you talking about? When you've settled what should be the proper attitude toward the Germans after the war. You'll be ready to die with easy heart? Maybe such decisions should always be made as if tomorrow were the last day. But you talk too easily about death. No, it's not easy, Emmanuel. I've also seen the Umschlagplatz, and so have you. It's a place of death. The situation is bad enough without exaggerating it. To root up half a million people and send them to labor camps or concentration camps... How comforting to believe that. I also wanted to believe it. But it's not longer possible. We're doomed, all of us. And you talk of forgiveness. Pull yourself together, Velvo. You came to tell me something? Sigmund has returned with news of the camp at Treblink. It's a death camp. An extermination center. Belville, it's certain beyond any doubt, Simon, that it has come at last. Why should it surprise us? Yet I am taken by surprise. They're sending five, six thousand a day. There isn't much time and so much to do. Belville, you heard Sigmund's report. Write it down in full detail. What's the matter? You remember it, don't you? I want to forget it, Emmanuel, but I can't. Not yet. First, you must put it in writing for the archives. You and your archives? You want the last drop of horror? People stripped naked and sent into buildings? Mark bathhouse? The hiss of gas? The cries when they understand the truth? Then the long silence? When the poison has done its work? Is that what you want? Shall I also tell you how the corpses are searched for rings and jewelry? How gold fillings are knocked out of the teeth before they are thrown like logs through the oven doors of the crematoria? My dear, my dear, no, 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 you mustn't. No, 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 we, we've talked about it. We knew it would come in one form or another, a little sooner or a little later. We've survived so far, together. With God's help, maybe... Uh, I couldn't help it, Emmanuel. I... I know, I know. I worry. Maybe awaken. I'll go to him. That was unnecessary, Velvo, and thoughtlessly cruel. There's paper on my table. Write it down. For the archives. Always the archives. Here are your archives. Grab the Don't paper! Don't tear my notes, Belvin. What do they matter now? Stop it! You talk and talk, but you have not yet taken it into your understanding. We are doomed, Belville. You and I and Simon are families and the Jews of Warsaw. We are dead men walking for a little while. And therefore, the manner of dying, the day and the spot, are not the most important things. No. We must tell what happened here, else how can the world prevent it from happening again? 
Belleville, the important thing is to record the history of our dying until the first smell of poison in our nostrils so that the world will know. <laughs> April 19th, 1943. The uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto. With pistols and with homemade bombs, we came out of the cellars and fought in the streets, in the houses, on the rooftops. May 11th, 1943. For three weeks, a handful of Jews have held off the German Wehrmacht, conquerors of all Europe. But what can rifles do against tanks and artillery and bombing planes? Does the world know? Why is it silent now of all times? Why don't they send help before it is... The Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto ended on May 16, 1943. A hundred square city blocks were pounded into dust and rubble. The last of half a million lives were taken. Emanuel Ringelblum was captured and sent to the slave camp at Ponyatov, from which he was smuggled out by the Jewish underground. Felvon, you're still alive. For the time being, listen, Emanuel. You're going to London, you and your family. The Polish government in exile has agreed to the rescue. Just we? We sent 19 names. Only three of the 19 are alive. I see. And the other two, they are leaving Poland? What does that have to do with it? Hurry, you have only half an hour. We're not going, Velvet. Don't be a fool. You're more valuable, free and alive in London. We'll remain here. Emmanuel, it's not just you. It's your wife and your son. I wish there were some way of saving them. But they are not the only wife and child in Poland. What you do with your own life? No one can stop you. But your wife! Ask her. I thank you, Velvel. But you see, I married him. And I've lived with him all these years. I suppose that whatever it is that makes him refuse to leave... Also keeps me here. All right. We have a hiding place for you in Warsaw. You'll be temporary Aryans. Well, well, I'll need some paper and... I know. You're working on your notes for the archives. March 7th, 1944. The voice is not Emanuel Ringelblum's. The Gestapo discovered the cellar in which he was hiding. He, his wife, their son Uri, and 35 others hiding with them. On that day, they were taken back to the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto for execution. No tears, Uri. Give me your hand. And take your mother's hand. The world will know, Uri. Stand up straight. And remember, no tears. Tears are his gift to us. For if all that happened there were unwept, how could the world survive? If you would like a copy of today's script, please send your name and address, 
with ten cents to cover the cost of postage and handling, to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. And now we take greatest pleasure in presenting Professor Abraham I. Katch, Chairman of the Department of Hebrew Culture and Education at New York University. Professor Katch. Our sages relate that during the cruel execution by the Romans of many of the Jewish scholars, one of the martyrs, Hanina ben Trajan, was wrapped up in a scroll of the law and burnt on a stake of fresh branches. As he was encircled by the flames, his disciples asked him, Master, what seest thou? To which he replied, Kvilin nisrafot ba'esh, ve'otiyod porachot ba'avir. I see scrolls burning, but the letters of the scrolls are flying away yonder. How well history was realized in the vision of this great scholar and teacher. The centers of the Torah have shifted from one place to another, from Palestine to Babylonia, thence to Spain, France, Germany, Poland, and finally America, where the greatest aggregate of all times has assembled. And as if to complete its cycle, and as a matter of poetic justice, the letters of the scrolls are also returning to their original home, Israel, the land of the Bible. Our story tells us that these letters are alive again, but liberty cannot be taken for granted. Nor is physical freedom inseparable from moral freedom. To prevent tyranny, we must also read the historic pages of horror which brought about the tragedy of today's play. For he who doesn't study history must repeat it. Man made in the image of God possesses the divine character of human personality and therefore was made to be free and given the right to be different and not to be penalized for it. But man must realize that freedom and education cannot be inherited. They must be regained by each one individually. If the ideas of peace, friendship, and universal brotherhood were to be followed as expounded by the prophets, if tools of destruction were converted to construction as taught by Isaiah, nations would not be engaged today in the training of armies for the slaughter of human beings. There would be no fear of aggression. Such a world would realize that in the wisdom and humanity of the noble teachings of the prophets, men gain not only guidance in solving their destiny, but also find solace and refreshment of soul, strength in the face of adversity, courage, stimulation, and hope in the face of defeat and disillusionment. Thank you, Professor Catch. Our eternal light drama today, The World Will Know, was written by Joseph Mendel and was based on material in Notes from the Warsaw Ghetto by Emanuel Ringelblum, edited and translated by Jacob Sloan, and published by the McGraw-Hill Book Company in New York. Cantor Robert H. Siegel sang the liturgical introduction. Leon Janney was featured as Emanuel Ringelblum, Others were Ida Reese Marin, Bernard Linrow, Roger DeCoven, and Guy Rep. Our narrator was Norman Rose. Due to the holidays of Sikoth, the Jewish festival of the tabernacles, and the Simchat Torah, the festival of the rejoicing of the law, the eternal light will not be heard for the next two weeks. The program will resume its normal schedule of broadcasting three weeks from today. This is Vic Roby. Our program was directed by George Vutsat. The weekly program is presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This is the NBC Radio Network.